Good morning and welcome to Sunday School at First Baptist Church. I, I'm so glad that you can be with us today, and I hope things are going well for you. Uh, I want to begin our, our session this morning by recalling a couple of things and uh, then reading a little bit of a, uh, of a devotion that uh, Beth and I saw uh, online from Joe McKeever. You might remember that right before we began this difficult period of the pandemic on March the 8th in 2020, our pastor preached on praying with expectation. Uh, and his uh, focal passage was Psalm 5-3. In the morning, Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning, I lay my request before you and wait expectantly. Uh, quite a lot has happened since there, then. And I'm sure many of us feel kind of frustrated in our prayer life sometimes uh, because we may feel... Uh, like Stuart uh, talked about in, in the sermon, that things that he prayed for and he didn't get an answer and uh, he had uh, an attitude sometimes of what's the use, but there is a use to pray. And he said, we need to pray. We need to pray with expectation. We need to pray expecting God, one, to hear us, and two, to answer in some way. And uh, we ran across... Uh, uh, this uh, devotion from Joe McKeever, who's a pastor in South Louisiana. Uh, and it was entitled, My Morning Prayer for May the 25th, 2020. Uh, listen to what Joe says. In the morning, O Lord, I will direct my song and my prayer unto you and will look up. I love you, Lord. I love you as much as I'm capable of. If I were you, I would not be satisfied with that. I would grow weary of watching me stumble and weary hearing me confess and repeat for the zillionth time, and yet you are patient, steadfast, forgiving to the ultimate, loving beyond anything that I imagine or ask. How can I begin to comprehend thy love and faithfulness? Help me, Father. I feel so weak, so helpless, so unworthy, so guilty, so lazy, and so unqualified. I feel fleshly, not spiritual, and burdened and free. If you are to mark, were to mark iniquities, O Lord, surely I would be the first to fall. Thank you for grace. Thank you for thy infinite mercy. Thank you that this is not about me. Thank you that thy mercies are new every morning and thy steadfastness endures to all generations. You do not deal with me according to my sins, but do not punish me according to our, my iniquity. And I find that truly amazing. It's all about thee. Thy riches, thy supply, thy will, and thy honor, thy name, thy kingdom, thy will. I have no words to say how liberating that is. Thank you, Lord. Not unto me, O Lord, but unto thee be all honor and glory and blessing. Not my will, O Lord, but thine be done. Not my way, O Lord, but thy way be mine. Not my wisdom, O Lord, but the wisdom be, thy wisdom be mine in every decision. Not my power, O Lord, but thy power in everything I do. Not my purposes, O Lord, but thy purpose is all I want. Not my strength, O Lord, but thy strength is my sufficiency. Not my joy, but the joy of the Lord in all I do. Not my provisions, O Lord, but the supply for all I need. Not my kingdom, O Lord, but thy kingdom come. Not my name, O Lord, but thy name be magnified and honored. Not my glory, O Lord, but all glory be to thee forever. Not my honor, O Lord, but all glory and honor and praise be unto thee, both now and forever. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom, strength and honor and glory and blessings. Thy name be hallowed, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Amen. Pray with me a moment before we begin this lesson. Father, may this be our prayer this morning, lifting you high and exalted far above us, not seeking our will, but your will, not seeking our honor, but your honor. And Father, we trust in you. We trust in you to, to solve these problems that face us so greatly as a world. We turn our hearts to you and we pray that many, many others will turn their hearts to you because in turning their hearts to you with a great revival, we can solve these problems. For we ask all these things in thy name. Now, if you've been with us, you know that we're in session four and in Proverbs four uh, today in our Sunday school lesson. 
And the, the title of this lesson I've chosen to get, assign it is Choosing the Right Path. And I think you'll understand that as we go along. I, I want to begin this lesson by, by using a quote that, that I came across in my reading this week. And I think it's a, a really good one that hits right to, the, uh, right to home as far as this passage is concerned. And, and it is a quote from one of the uh, commentaries that I've been reading. And uh, look at that with me for a moment. Here's what it says. Only a parent can implore the young man to do what is right with the depth of love and concern displayed here. This text, more than any other, brings out the urgency of parental love. In addition, this passage illustrates how wisdom is an inheritance that may be passed from generation to generation. It can preserve a whole family line through the passing of years. It is, however, an inheritance that each generation must choose to receive. If the chain is broken and the way of wisdom is rejected, the results will be disastrous for the family. Ronald Reagan, I think it was, who said that we're only one generation from losing our democracy. The same is true of uh, the heritage of a family. Uh, families pass on a lot more than material wealth uh, or how someone looks, uh, but they pass on a love for uh, Jesus Christ or they pass on uh, a way of life that's not acceptable to God. And uh, I know uh, from my own experience that that heritage is something to be really treasured and something that you really want to pass on to your children if, if it's been the part of your life. So I would say with what, with what one of the writers uh, said that I read, let the cycle of wisdom roll on. Let it go on. Let the, let the cycle of the gospel roll, roll on. Here's what chapter 4 looks like. If you divide it up, it, 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 there are three appeals that are made in chapter 4. The first appeal is in verses 1 through 9, and it establishes the home as the primary place of education. The second appeal comes in chapters, uh, verses 10 through 19. It lifts up the family bond as the major concern of this text. And then finally, uh, the last appeal comes in 20 through 27, and it's the fathers who's who scarcely concerns himself with specific moral issues, but he simply urges his son to stay true to the path of wisdom. Let's, let's look at this, beginning with verses 1 uh, through 4. If you're in your Bibles, uh, you'll see I'm in the NIV. It says, Listen, my sons, to a father's instruction. Pay attention and gain understanding. I give you sound learning, so do not forsake my teaching. When I was a boy in my father's house, still tender and an only child of my mother, he taught me. And he said, lay hold of my words with all of your heart. Keep my commands and you will live. This opening appeal includes all of the first nine verses and it includes a, a lengthy quote from the teacher's own father. Uh, the emphasis is on this multi-generational nature of the message being conveyed here. And, and as I thought about this, it, uh, if this is Solomon speaking here, uh, then his sons are hearing not only from Solomon, but they're hearing from King David as well, because David was his, uh, was his father. And, and in, in fact, these verses which follow in 4 through 9 would be the words... Of David. The writer here indicates that the best pattern for passing on wisdom is from one generation to the next. We only have one chance to do that. So we have to really uh, take full advantage of that opportunity. Uh, the, the, the sons that he's talking to are being invited to participate in a tradition of uh, of, of wisdom. Uh, the people who have gone before them, uh, as the New Testament says in 2 Timothy 4, 7, have fought the good fight, they finished the race, they kept the faith. Now Proverbs 4 is, is pointing out and alerting these sons, because it is addressed to more than one, 
is, al are, is alerting them to the value of these past voices. Remember your leaders, uh, says Hebrews 13, 7. Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of the way of their life and imitate their faith. More specifically, the emphasis here is on the love that causes a father to plead with his son to stay in the right path. I don't think I ever really realized this until I became a father myself. I was fortunate to have Christian parents, and they really saw to it that I uh, followed the right path as long as I was under uh, their leadership and under their guidance, and I was so thankful that they taught me that because it is an important thing for parents to understand what their generational responsibility is in passing on to the people who come after them. The word understanding here uh, is a word that is used interchangeably with several other words in the verses that follow all throughout this chapter. Wisdom, understanding, commands, teachings, and even law uh, show the binding and authoritative character uh, of these teachings. Uh, and and the, the author here will use them uh, interchangeably as he goes through. In fact, as we talked about in the introduction to this, this is part of the poetic parallelism that we find throughout the book of Psalms. It's comparison and contrast statements throughout the book. And in that last statement, you will live. Wisdom's legacy is life. The power and ability to survive whatever snares and pitfalls one may encounter. They have the ability to do that through the wisdom that they gain. That they gain from their father, that they gain from scripture, wherever it might come from. Now let's look at, at the, the next verses 5 through 9. In 5 through 9, the writer says, Get wisdom, get understanding. Do not forget my words or swerve from them. Do not forsake wisdom, and she will protect your, your love, uh, you, your love her, and she will watch over you. Wisdom is supreme, therefore get wisdom. Though it costs all you have, get understanding. Esteem her, and she will exalt you. Embrace her, and she will honor you. She will set a garland of grace on your head and present you with a crown of of splendor. When I was coaching, uh, a lot of the decisions that I made as a coach, uh, especially during a ball game, were based on risk reward. Uh, how big is this risk? How big is the reward? If it's a big risk, it better be a big reward. Don't do something that's a big risk and has a small reward. In this case, the risk is not great and the reward is tremendous. And so this is a risk and reward type of situation. The reward is far greater than what the risk is. So the, the author says, the, the teacher says, get wisdom. The emphasis falls on the word get. It's a word that in this context means to acquire, to bring into your possession, and it carries with it the connotation without regard to cost. To get is strengthened by what the prize is. The prize is, is, a, is a great prize, and, it's, and it is a prize that, uh, that, that will last you for a lifetime. And then the, the author says, it may cost you a lot, but the, the reward is much greater. If, it, it, it costs you all you have, then, then do it, even if, it's, if the price is great. If you want God's wisdom, then it's gonna cost you effort. It's gonna cost you time. It'll cost you all your pre preconceived ideas about how life is supposed to work. It's easy to make worldly decisions often, but it's not easy to make those that following the straight path requires. Why pay the price, though? Why pay the price for this? Because God's wisdom will make you alive, it says. It's going to give you life. Because His wisdom will keep you and guard you, it says. His wisdom will exalt you and honor you and crown you with beauty. This is how life really works. It's a life worth living. We face the same choice 
when we face the choice for our Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, to seek wisdom and to seek Christ are all in the same league. The sense of this text is very clear. Wisdom is the greatest possession that you can have. And the young man should make winning her the primary goal of his life, no matter what it takes. <clears throat> the teacher here talks about being the, the person who receives wisdom as being exalted and honored and a garland of grace being put on their head. Wisdom will repay in kind with status, public approval, as evidenced by this festive ornament. And this is not an ornament that crowns for authority. It's simply, simply for proc, uh, popular acclamation, like winning a contest. If, if you've gotten wisdom, then you have received a great reward. Uh, so the affections and the pleading tone of these uh, verses uh, shows why parents sometimes make the best teachers. They care about their children. They want their children to have be what's best for them in life, and so they teach them what's best in life. An issue is the right of the parent to, to uh, teacher to impose instruction or command or admonition upon the younger generation. That right is explained and defended, uh, and that the teacher cites the setting and the content of his own education at the feet of his parents. He, he's, he's saying, I want what's best for you, but it's also my right to be able to teach you that. One is reminded here of the, uh, the, the book of Deuteronomy and the Shema, the Shema which says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Lord, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commandments I give you today are to be on your hearts, impress them on your children, talk about them when you sit at home, and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up, tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. In other words, the law commands me to do this, he says. God's, our covenant with God says that I should teach you these ways of wisdom. Note that from here to the end of this of this chapter, there's going to be some various components of language that are very important as the, as the writer continues to make this long metaphor, this long extended metaphor about the way or the path to wisdom. Uh, there are nouns like way, path, and track that, that are used. Then there are verbs that, uh, that, are like, that, that, that give a, a strong emphasis to action that ought to be taken taught and guided, led, walk, run, stumble, enter, step, avoid, travel, pass on, turn away, remove. You listen for those words as we go through. And then there are expressions to describe the white, right way. And they are informative in nature. That is that the word bring, will bring forth an image or should bring forth an image to your mind. Like straight and right and smooth without impediment, or cause for stumbling, filled with increasing light, not pitch black darkness, demanding eyes to be fixed upon, feet disciplined from wandering to the right or to the left. So listen for those words as we go through. Now let's move forward to verses 10 through 12. He says, listen, my son, and accept what I say. Now notice in that verse, he goes from the plural to the singular. He's been talking to a group in the beginning, and now he's talking just to his son. He says, listen, my son, this is probably the oldest son, accept what I say, and the years of your life will be many. I guide you in the way of wisdom and lead you along the straight paths. When you walk, your steps will not be hampered. When you run, you will not stumble. Remember what wisdom looked like. There was wisdom envisioned in earlier chapters as a, as a statue or as a goddess who's standing there. And in one hand, which was the right hand, she held a long life. And in her left hand, she held riches and honor. And you need to choose the, the good prize here. Uh, the, 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 he says that you need to go along 
the straight paths. This is the theme. This is the chief description for habitual, consistent conduct. It is the, the urging to establish habits in life, good habits. It's the primary image that's used here in this chapter. When you think about that, we, we all try to get uh, uh, our children, if you have children, uh, to, uh, to establish good habits, good eating habits, brushing their teeth twice a day. And once you get established in those habits, you continue to do them. And the same is true in the decisions you make, whether they're wise decisions or whether they're worldly decisions. You create those habits of how you make decisions, create those habits of what your decisions are based on, and you tend to, to, to move toward those habits as life puts decision-making opportunities before you. And so the teacher here wants this, this child, this son, to walk along the straight paths and to adopt those decision-making tools that he's giving to him. Now look at verses 13 through 17. Here's some of those words. Hold on to instruction and do not let it go. Guard it well, for it is your life. Do not set foot on the path of the wicked or walk in the way of evil men. Avoid it. Do not travel on it. Turn from it and go on your way. For they cannot sleep till they do evil. They are robbed of slumber till they make someone fall. They eat the bread of wickedness and drink the wine of violence. So beginning here in verse 13, we have all of these words that I've talked to, uh, talked to you about. And, and they're, uh, they're, they're lacing together uh, these ideas of the way, the path that you should follow as you go through, go, go through life. The teacher aims to equip every young student that he's teaching with a lifetime and it, of, of good decisions. His topic is not so much individual day-by-day -day decisions, but it's about the long course of life. Life is not a sprint. It's a marathon. And we, we need to know how to survive over the length uh, of that life. But he, he warns in this section here of two specific things to avoid. And that would be the wicked and the evildoers. Notice how he characterizes them. He says that, that their depravity is such that they seek nothing but evil. They live for crime. That's all they live for. Uh, it is food and drink to them. It is what nourishes them, he says. Uh, they don't commit crimes in order to live. They live to commit crimes. Their greatest satisfaction is in making other people fail, but they too will fall at one point. So crooked is their life, and so deviant from the straight that they can't sleep and sleep satisfied until they have done harm to someone, to the innocent, and made well-meaning people fall flat on their face. The inclusion of sleep and diet in this description, uh, one writer says, shows how com comprehensive this term is. These people, are, they're evil to the core. Now, I, I can't say that I've ever met anybody like that, but I know there are probably people like that that exist. Uh, evil becomes for them compulsive, and none of us are really above that, if you think about it, because this is the nature of our depraved hearts. Remember where we came from. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We've all sinned. We're all depraved. We're all sinners. Sin is a slavery deep inside, an emotional engine we cannot shut down just by choosing to do so. We've got to have help. And our help came from Jesus Christ, and He continues with us in the Holy Spirit. Helps us every day in our decision-making. I like what Alexander McLaren described, how he described these sinners, these, these, these criminals. 
He says they are very grossly criminal sinners, the worst sort of all. They are only content when they have done harm and delight in making others as bad as they are. We go back to that idea that we've expressed before, that sinners like company. They want people with them who are doing the bad things of life. Now let's look at two verses, two verses that, that paint an image for us. First, let's look at verse 18. You see the image on the screen? The verse says, The path of the righteous is like the first gleam of dawn, shining ever brighter till the full light of day. Uh, my wife and I like to, to take pictures of the, of the sunrises, she more than I. Uh, but uh, we have a gorgeous uh, view of the sun coming up outside our back windows. And this is just one of many that we've taken from there. But the sunrise symbolizes to him the righteous beginning to walk in the light of day. There's a figure that's presented here. It's a figure of two groups of travelers. One is the just and the righteous. They begin life every day at daybreak, and they walk in the sunlight that shines ever brighter until you get to midday, and at midday the light is full force, and the day is fully established. It's perfect, and it's, a, and, and it's ability to illuminate that lights up every obstacle that might be in the path. It turns uh, the path into something that is not a threat, and it's, the threats are almost non-existent. So well can the daytime traveler find things. That's where the righteous travel. They travel in the daylight, and they begin at dawn. But the way of the wicked, the way of the wicked is explained in verse 19. But the way of the wicked is like deep darkness. They do not know what makes them stumble. Deep darkness. Deep, deep darkness. That language is used in Exodus 20, 10, 21 through 22. And it described the plague of darkness which covered Egypt in the time of the ten plagues. It was a darkness that made people stumble. And so the people who start off in the evening, they know, they do not know what's going to make them stumble because they can't see it. The wicked set up their way at dusk only to find themselves soon immersed in darkness, so dense that they stumble without knowing why. Dawn and dusk, we know, uh, are about the same level of light. They're the same level of light, but the perspective journeys are poles apart. One is secure in the ability uh, to, to scan from horizon to horizon and know precisely how the land lies. The other is ambling anglessly with very familiar la uh, every familiar la landmark obliterated by the impenetrable pale of darkness and every step and exercise of fear and futility. So which would you rather step out into? The way of the righteous traveling in the light are the way of the unrighteous traveling in the way of darkness. We face only two alternatives in life, the wise way or the evil way. There is no compromise position. So the principle here that's being taught in 418 and 19 is that God illuminates the path of the righteous continuously. And as we walk in faith, the divine light shines more and more, clarifying and confirming the perfect plan and will of God. Sometimes the hardest task for us to do is to abandon what we've been doing successfully and to go into a new venture. But I found that, that God's will lights the path for you, no matter where you might go. And you look back and, and you look in retrospect and you say, golly, that was exactly the right thing for me to do because God was lighting up the path for me. Wearsby puts it this way. If we walk in the way of God's wisdom, the path gets brighter and brighter, and there is no sunset. When the path ends, we step into a land where the light never dims, for there shall be no night there. 
that's the, that's the description of a, of a righteous life that's been lived. That's the description of a child of God. A child has given his heart to Jesus Christ. You walk in the light. And as you walk in the light, you live in the light for the rest of your earthly life and eternal life. And that's the way you want it to be. But the people who walk in darkness stumble and stagger. And they don't know what's ahead of them. What a shame. Now let's look at verses 20 through 23. Here we come to the closing argument of chapter 4 and 20 through 27. These four verses here say, My son, pay attention to what I say. Listen closely to my words. Do not let them out of your sight. Keep them within your heart. For they are life to those who find them and health to a man's whole body. Above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. I love that last verse. We'll talk about it more in just a minute. Uh, notice in the beginning here, as any other parent, the, the writer says, pay attention. Pay attention. In the words of any parent you might find, this is the most important thing that they're going to say. And they say, I want your full attention. I used to say this to uh, to kids that I would be at, at school with in a group or even with my own church, but children when I talk to them. I say, I want to see your eyes looking at my eyes. Then I'll know I have your attention because I want your full attention when I say what I'm going to say to you now. And so the, the, he, he is saying, you must receive and retain the words of the parent and you must listen very closely. Give them your full attention. Uh, the eyes being riveted on the giver of the information so that we know that you have attention. And then this, this image of the heart. Uh, the force uh, in Proverbs 4.23 is seen in the heart as the wellspring. There are a couple of ways to look at this. If you think about uh, the place uh, where the writer lived. Very arid, desert uh, around him. Uh, maybe a few places where there were, was an oasis or streams that ran. And so a wellspring was an image of something very important. It's from this wellspring that, that the spring of water comes out and it, it provides life and sustains life. In this case, your heart being the wellspring, wise persons will give information out. And, and those that are around them will receive that information. Uh, there was scarcely any treasure that was more widely protected than that of a wellspring of water. And so the writer's saying here, like a wellspring of water is your heart. Let that give out information that sustains life. To keep it from turning uh, into brackish water uh, was the goal of anyone. So don't let your heart go bad. The heart here is always, is not the physical organ. It's the mind and, and it's even the whole personality of the individual that's involved. It is the wellspring that has the capacity to give joy and life and vigor and ultimately comes from within, not from the circumstance that may surround you, from the Holy Spirit who indwells you. That's where your wellspring of life is. The corrupt heart draws one down to the grave, the Bible says, but wisdom protects the heart from that corruption. Life does, does not flow from the outside in. That's not the way that you gain joy and you gain understanding. It flows from the inside out. We need our hearts continuously filled with the, the Holy Spirit and the fresh life of Jesus Christ and our faith in the gospel. We will not lose our way on the journey of life if we do that. And it will keep, it will keep us coming back to Jesus because at Jesus we find acceptance, we find forgiveness, we find His promises being kept, and we find His love. Everything flows out from that deep wellspring that's in us. But if you pollute the wellspring, 
If you pollute it, the infection will spread and before long, hidden appetites will become open sins and public shame. So you need to keep that wellspring good and in good shape and, and not let it become polluted. Uh, one writer warns that instructing man to guard his heart, and I thought this was an interesting concept, it is like putting the fox in the hen house to protect the hens. Now, bear with me for a minute on that. He's his own worst enemy, often cra caving to the sensual appetites of the flesh. Notwithstanding, though, Solomon is right. Man is to keep or to guard his heart. But the means by which it is done is all, all important to success. He must relinquish control of his heart to someone else. That someone else, in our case, in the case of, of Solomon, even though he didn't know how to express it in our terms, was the Lord Jesus Christ. It was wisdom for Solomon. With Christ seated upon the throne, a man's heart becomes what God wants it to. It's kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. 1 Peter 1, 5. That's what our hearts are. If we, if we allow them to be controlled by God, if we allow God to be on the throne of our heart, Jesus Christ to be on the throne of our heart, and allow the Holy Spirit to speak words of wisdom to us, then our hearts will be protected. As I, as I read these verses, I couldn't help but think of a song uh, that I've heard many times and sung a lot uh, called Guard My Heart. And uh, it speaks of one particular type of sin, but it was a song that was made popular by Steve Green. And here's what the words say. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. For the Father up above is looking down in love. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. What appears to be harmless glance can turn to romance and homes are divided. Feelings that should never have been awakened within, tearing the heart in two. Listen, I beg you, guard your heart. Guard your heart. Don't trade it for treasure. Don't give it away. Guard your heart. Guard your heart. As a payment for pleasure, it's a high price to pay. For a soul that remains sincere, with conscience clear, Guard your heart. The human heart is easily swayed and often betrayed at the hand of emotion. You dare not leave the outcome to chance. You must choose in advance or live with the agony such needless tragedy. Guard your heart. Guard your heart. Don't trade it for treasure. Don't give it away. Guard your heart. Guard your heart. As a payment for pleasure, it's a high price to pay. For a soul that remains sincere, with conscience clear, guard your heart. If you keep your heart with all vigilance for his sake, Christ will fill you with the springs of life. With a heart filled by Christ, you will never lose your way. Now let's look at verses 24 and 25. He says, put away perversity. From your mouth, keep corrupt talk from your lips. Let your eyes look straight ahead. Fix your gaze directly before you. Lips. He who guards his lips guards his life, but he who speaks rashly will come to ruin. That's in Proverbs 13, 3. I think that describes why your lips are so important. Speak, uh, speak with confidence, but guard what you say because they can lead you to tragedy. Uh, this, this idea of looking straight ahead, that, that's an idea that uh, uh, is important in lots of things. George W. Truett said in a sermon, The Threefold Secret of Great Life, he emphasized the valueness of singleness of focus in regard to the pursuit of life. And he said this, and you have to think about this. He said, the one thing I do, not a dozen things, not even two things, but the one thing I do. That's focus. That's, that's to look straight ahead. Uh, I can remember uh, uh, when my granddaddy was still able to do this, uh, he kept a garden that he plowed with a mule. And he kept that mule uh, with blinders on 
so that nothing would come along to distract him because he didn't want his rows not to be straight. And he didn't want that mule to, to get upset. And so he wanted that mule to do nothing but look straight ahead so that he could plow a straight row. And he plowed some long straight rows with a mule. I can still see him with his, with his uh, overalls on and barefooted uh, in Calvin, Louisiana. Pray, he was plowing with a mule and had the, the mule plowing just a perfect straight row. And so look straight ahead. Don't swerve from one side to the other. Fix your eyes on Jesus and let, it, uh, let that be what, what leads you where they go. Uh, in Hebrews 12, 1 through 2, the writer says, And let us turn with perse perseverance, run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. When you're in a race, you want to run a straight line. When you're in life, you want to go down the straight and narrow path. And let's look at verses 26 and 27. continues along those same way. Uh, ideas. He said, make level paths for your feet and take only ways that are firm. Do not swerve to the right or to the left. Keep your foot from evil. I, I think about that statement there where it says, only ways th that are firm. I have a new lawnmower and it's a zero turn lawnmower, my first experience with a zero turn. And uh, zero turn lawnmowers uh, in the drive wheels are very powerful. And uh, if you get on the least slick area in your yard, you're liable to get stuck because they don't grip slow. They, they catch and they, they go along. And so you got to be ready to avoid those places that are not firm. I tell you that from experience, from the first time I ever drove this lawnmower on my yard. You've got to watch for the firm places so that you don't get stuck. And he says, do not swerve to the right or the left, but keep your foot from evil. Uh, the, the image of the path, being on the right path and, and, and not, not deviating from it, not being distracted from uh, the, the way of wisdom. The Hebrew here symbolizes the tendency of People to roam aimlessly from one side of the road to another. And ch wisdom's chosen path is not an aimless path. It's a straight path. Uh, so you've got to discipline yourself to resist the distraction. The concern in, in verses 20 through 27 is the whole person is being made clear here. The wisdom teachers are interested in educating the man to be the right kind of person the child, to be the right kind of person, to move straight ahead through life. They want, him to, they want this child, and it, man or woman, the Bible usually refers to things in a masculine uh, gender, but it's a, a discerning person keeps wisdom in view and, and, and walks down that straight and firm path. But the foolish person wanders left and right and ends up in trouble. And difficulty. Uh, in verses 26 and 27, where he says, Do not swerve left and right. Now, I think about uh, teaching uh, people that, that, that I coached in, in cross country, especially. When you're running, pick a point out far ahead of you, because one thing you want to do is the most efficient path to where you're trying to get to go. And if you look far down the road, far down the path, you're going to run better in a straight line. The same thing goes with teaching my uh, children to drive cars. When you were out on the highway and we're driving to keep from swaying back and forth, pick out a point ahead of you and, and, and go to that point and you can get there straight. So the, the, the wise person stays focused on life, stays focused on the things that are straight ahead. I want to close this uh, section out with two quotes that, that I thought were really good. The first one comes from Warren Wiersbe. And he says, if we're walking in the way of wisdom, God promises to protect our path, to direct our path, and perfect our path. 
All folly can offer is danger, detours, and disappointments, ultimately leading to death. It shouldn't be too difficult, then, to make the right choice. And that's what this, this lesson is about. Which path will you take? Which choice will you make? And then closing out from, and I ran across this quote for, in a book that was a, a book of devotionals. And, and, and it, is, it is very descriptive of what we've been talking about. Uh, the writer says there, there are but two paths on which a person may choose to walk. One path is that which leads to the city of Zion. The other leads to eternal banishment from the presence of God. The one is lit with the brilliance of Christ. The other is enveloped in darkness. The saved in heaven will be in a domain where there is no darkness. For God is the light of the city. The lost will be in hell where there is nothing but blackness of darkness forever. Choose wisely. That's important. Choose wisely where you go. I must needs go home by the way of the cross. There's no other way but this. I shall ne'er get sight of the gates of light if the way of the cross I miss. The way of the cross leads home. The way of the cross leads home. It is sweet to know that as I onward go, the way of the cross leads home. Father, I pray that that's our goal, that we'll follow the way of the cross, that we'll follow the straight and narrow, we'll follow the path that's on firm ground, and we won't be distracted. We'll guard our hearts and not allow ourselves to be distracted, and we'll depend on the Holy Spirit will depend on the leadership of the Holy Spirit to keep us on that path. That's my prayer today for me and for all who are watching. Amen. Hope you have a good week.